So the Jewish faith, the Jewish culture, the Jewish customs does not have sacraments. They don't. What they have is rituals. So slightly different. Sacraments in Christianity, remember, were specific events that happened to bring Jesus closer to you. And remember in Judaism, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't. So they wouldn't have a sacrament that would bring Jesus closer to them. They have rituals, um, specific events, practices, things like that, that help them remember what their ancestors did and it binds their community tighter together. They experience specific things as part of that community. Okay, so rituals, not sacraments. That's, that's the big takeaway there with Judaism. Um, so we're going to talk about some of them. There are a bunch of different sacraments, but let's talk about some of them and see if there's any comparisons or if you have more questions about different things, just let me know. Okay. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about, I'm going to butcher the name and I apologize up front. Um, it's called a Brit Mila or a Bris, um, frequently known as a Bris. So a Bris is after a baby is born, I believe it's nine days, and it only happens with males. Um, this would be a time where the male baby would receive their circumcision, or a moil is what his name is. It's a religious person who is special training, and he's Jewish, and he cuts the foreskin from the tip of the penis. That's what he does. Um, a bris is very important because circumcision is very important in the Jewish culture. Um, that is the mark of our covenant with God. And so all of the babies that are male have a circumcision. And there is a big ritual. There's different prayers and things that happen um, at the bris. And then, of course, it's followed with a party with lots of food because everything with Judaism is followed by a party with lots of food because that's just what they do. Uh, the next one that we're gonna talk about is called a bar or bat mitzvah. And this happens, again, depending on your movement because some movements don't have bat mitzvahs because that's for the girl. Um, some just do the for the boy, which would be the bar mitzvah. Um, but the bat mitzvah happens at age 12, bar mitzvah, Bar mitzvah happens at age 13. And typically what happens in that ritual is the boy or the girl, they, they claim their relationship with God or Hashem. They claim and show their understanding of Torah. They basically, it's their time to say, okay, I've been taught all of this information and now I'm taking ownership of it. I'm choosing to own my Judaism. I'm choosing to own my knowledge. I'm choosing instead of having a parent choose for you. Okay. Frequently the child will receive like a tiny Torah or some small gifts things like that. They will read a portion of the Torah in Hebrew because that's important and the Jewish culture, again, Hebrew is the language that the Torah is written in, so it's important for them to have a certain ability of being able to read Hebrew. So they do different things, they chant. It's, it's a very exciting time. It can be very overwhelming for a 12 or a 13 year old because that's a lot of pressure, especially the boys. Um, that tends to happen a lot with their voice cracking, cracking as they enter puberty and it's, embarrassing but it's also a very it's a very proud time it is the first time they are able to be called up to the Torah um, a beautiful thing happens right before their bar bat mitzvah service um, the parents tend to wrap them in the tallit for the first time because prior to that they didn't need to and it's a beautiful thing about there's, there's different words that go along with it, but basically um, they say something along the lines of, we have loved and supported you and we keep you in our care and now we trust for you to be in Hashem's care as well. And they wrap it around and 
not gonna lie, I would probably cry if I was in that part. And that would also be the first time that they are typically required to then wear a yarmulke. Um, again, depending on the movement, females are not required to wear yarmulkes. Um, in all synagogues, females are not required to wear talits in all synagogues. In some synagogues, they are not allowed or permitted to wear talits, and it's more of a male thing. But at the bar or bat mitzvah, that would be the first time they can go up to Torah, and in order to go up to Torah, they need to have a talit on, and they need to have a yarmulke, typically, unless you're a female, and it's different movements, and then it's a different thing. But moving on, the next um, ritual that we're gonna talk about is the mikvah. Um, mikvah is something that males and females can do. However, females tend to use it more frequently. A mikvah is a pool of water and it has to be a natural flowing body of water. So it has to come from nature. It can't have chlorine, it can't be like a pump, it, none of that, it has to be naturally flowing. So people will use the mikvah in like rivers or a lake or the ocean, or they will go to a building that has one of these natural flowing sources. Um, and it kind of looks like a small plunge pool. It's not necessarily as, sometimes it's as big as a hot tub, but it's typically not bigger than that. Um, it is a very small area. Some are gorgeous and ornate, or, ornately decorated. Some are rather simple, and that's quite all right too. Um, it is a very private space because when you enter the mikvah, you do so alone. And you do so alone because you enter without any clothes on. Um, when you go into the mikvah, you are, you are fully submerging and you are coming out a new person. So you can't have earrings, you can't have makeup, you can't have nail polish, like there's a whole thing that you do before you go into the mikvah. And then when you walk down the stairs into the mikvah, when you are ready to do your dunks, there is a person who comes and watches, not to be cute, not to check out your tushy or anything like that. They are watching to make sure that your hair and your head, it goes completely submerged. And you also have to pick your feet up from the bottom when you're doing your dunks because you can't be touching anything. And then when you're doing your dunks, you also have different prayers that you will say, um, different blessings that help enhance that opportunity, okay? Um, the mikvah can be a very emotional time because when you come out of the mikvah, you are renewing your relationship with Hashem. And as a convert, it is very common for people to cry or tear up while they're in the mikvah or coming out because they are entering into a whole new relationship that they didn't have before. It can be a beautiful thing. So females tend to use the mikvah more than males. Um, it is not necessarily required for males to use the mikvah unless they are converting. A uh, female would use the mikvah before they get married, before, I'm sorry, after they have a baby, after they had their menstrual cycle, and while they're converting, you can certainly use the mikvah every day of the week if you want to, and some people do, but those are the times where you typically use the mikvah, okay? Um, mikvahs are sometimes difficult to come by depending on where you live. Um, for myself, I live about a half an hour away from my synagogue and that synagogue does not have a mikvah. It costs quite a bit of money to keep them up. They tend to be in the bigger cities that have multiple synagogues. Understandably so, because it's more expensive and you'd want it to be where the people are. The next, the next ritual is one that I love. It actually has to do with weddings. It's called the Bedeckin Ceremony. And that is a ritual that I hope to take part in when I get married. And that ceremony, that ritual, um, getting ready for the wedding, the bride and the groom are typically kept separate. They, they dress and do other stuff all together. But at the Bedeckin ceremony, the groom comes in, sees the bride, 
verifies that yes, that's the person he's going to marry, and then they place the veil over the bride's face. And the bride remains veiled until after the ceremony then, when he lifts the veil again. It's beautiful. I think it's a very intimate time and I love that. And it's to remember the story where, oh goodness, I'm gonna get the names messed up. But it was two sisters, Rachel and Leah, and basically there was this guy and he wanted to marry one of the sisters. And so he worked for the for the dad for a while to say, okay, can I please marry her? And the dad said, yes, absolutely, okay, we're gonna go. And what he did, the dad switched and he put the other sister in her place because the other sister was older. Yeah. So he essentially married somebody thinking it was one person, but it was actually the other person. And that was not so very fun. So in honor of that, to remember that, that's why that ritual takes place. Okay. There is another ritual that is reciting the Shema. Shema is a beautiful prayer and it is so powerful in Judaism. It's Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Elonai Ahad. Adonai Ahad. Sorry, I said it incorrectly. It's basically saying that you are my God, you are the one God, just proclaiming that out loud. And it is such a powerful prayer and it's so beautiful if you're ever in a synagogue and you hear them say the prayer that people will take small versions of it on tiny scrolls and they will actually put it into these little containers called mezuzahs and they'll stick them on doorposts just within their house or outside their house just basically to claim this space as God's space to keep a spot for him in your life, to make a very visual reminder that he is God overall. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and then the last one that I have listed today is called, I'm sorry, is just Shabbat. Shabbat is that purposeful pause that people in the Jewish community do on Shabbat, which is Friday night into Saturday night. And that's their pause from work for the week to remember on the seventh day of creation when God paused and he rested. So that's what they do on Shabbat. Now, during Shabbat, there's other rituals. For example, when Shabbat is welcomed in, there will be candles and they say blessings over that. There will be wine, they say blessings over that. There'll be bread, they'll say blessings over that. And then there are certain things as a ritual that they do not partake in during Shabbat. And again, depending on your movement, depends on exactly what that looks like. And then to end Shabbat, they have a what's called a Havdalah service or a Havdalah service. And there's candle lighting again with more prayers about that. There's spices and you smell the spices and there's a prayer about that. And there's some wine and you say a prayer about that. And there you do different things to remember specific portions throughout history, to connect you with the ancestors that have given so much to help you be where you are today. And it's a pretty awesome thing. So there you go. Sacraments in Christianity are specific things that they partake in to bring Jesus closer to them and to strengthen that relationship with Jesus. In Judaism, they do not have sacraments they instead have rituals, which are specific tasks that are performed at specific times within your life to connect with the ancestors and remember the struggles that they went through and the things that they provided and opportunities that have now been open to you. So there you go. That's sacraments and Christianity and Judaism. And they're both awesome. They're both wonderful. They both have a lot of meaning and what you choose to partake in is up to you. So we'll see you next time and we'll keep learning together. Bye-bye.